All right, guys, welcome to our first tertulia of this quarter. Um, we're happy to have Dr. Carvajal with us today. Um, he'll explain later on, you know, briefly what his research is on, what he does, and how his experience has been so far at UC San Diego. I'm going to briefly introduce Dr. Carvajal. Uh, he obtained his bachelor's degree in Spanish and Latin American studies from the University of Kansas and obtained uh, their PhD in Latin American literature and cultures from the University of Texas in Austin. Much of their research focuses on indigenous writing, coloniality, and Mesoamerican literature and civilization, specifically researching pedagogical approaches to indigenous language learning especially Quiche, Central American Literature and Culture, Poetry, Translation, and Digital Humanities. Some fun facts of Dr. Carvajal includes that they were born in the beautiful country of Costa Rica, Pura Vida. <laughs> <laughs> they love poetry and avidly writes and translates them, and the fact that he loves riding bikes. We're grateful to have Dr. Carvajal join us this year as not only a faculty member of the Spanish and Comparative Literature Department, but also as an affiliated Latin American Studies professor. And profit time is yours. Thank you so much for that information. Oh, thanks. Yeah, the joke I always say is that you can clap at the end to the side of you. Actually liked it. Or <laughs> you want to do a medium clap or a big clap? Thank you for that presentation. I'm a little... Thank you. That's you, you, you know, you went all out with the introduction. I appreciate the time, and I'm also horrified that you went and found all, a bunch of stuff about me on the internet. So uh, thank you for being here. Um, I actually taught a Latin American Studies undergraduate seminar in this room last quarter. Uh, so um, even in the short time that I've been here, this room has been a special place because I had a wonderful class and learned a lot with my students. Um, thank you for the invitation to talk to you all in this tertulia. I've prepared a little bit about uh, my research and a project that I'm working on right now, but um, we can be as informal as we want and ask any questions that we want uh, after I'm done. Uh, I won't ramble on for too long. I have to say that I'm like super nervous about being recorded and uh, all that, so if I say dumb stuff, maybe I'll say all the dumb stuff at the beginning and get it out of the way. <laughs> but um, yeah, so. Yeah, that's what I'll say to start off. Thank you again for the introduction and the invitation. And thank you for making time out of your busy, busy days uh, to come and uh, be here. Um, so yeah, my name is Ignacio Carvajal. I'm an assistant professor in literature. Uh, this is my first year here at UCSD. And uh, like Eric was mentioning, I'm part of uh, the Latinx Cluster Higher Initiative. And so it's work that's sort of trying to expand collaborations between Latin American studies and Chickenex Latinx studies and other departments. And so I wanted to just uh, today talk a little bit about um, um, a project of mine, uh, specifically uh, a research project that I'm doing. And this is what I'm going to do today. And I'll try to verbalize the slides that I have, which are just sort of a map of what the talk will look like today. So uh, I want to just do a little bit of an acknowledgment and talk about my positionality, who I am. Uh, I want to situate us geographically on the area that uh, my research is based in. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, sort of like my big research project and then one tiny little part of it uh, that I'm working on currently. And then we'll be able to have a discussion and hear what you all want to know more about. Um, yeah, um, so my work is mostly in the intersections between literary and cultural studies, Latin American studies, indigenous studies. Um, even though I'm not a linguist myself, uh, it is influenced by linguistics as well. Um, so those are just some of my influences. And then uh, in terms of positionality, of course, I always begin with acknowledging that we are in Kumeyaay land. So I've, I'm, very, I'm a newcomer to this place and hope to learn more about uh, that, you know, straddling uh, a nation state border, right, that divides it. Uh, but of course, acknowledge the presence, displacement, and continued presence and survival, of course. And then I, like uh, Eric mentioned, I was born in Costa Rica, um, moved to the United States because my father came to go to grad school back in the day, and uh, we stayed. We went to uh, grad school in Texas, and uh, 
Uh, eventually went to Kansas where I lived again before coming here this fall. Um, so I am Central American. Uh, I'm not indigenous. Uh, I'm a mestizo or a Ladino, as they say in Guatemala. Um, so all of these things are uh, factors that influence my research and my work, and uh, I want to be, I like to be straightforward about it because there are great things about it and also contradictory things about it, uh, especially working in indigenous languages. So uh, situating us geographically, for those of us who may be less familiar with the area, this is a couple of uh, maps from Guatemala. So we have, uh, you know, with contemporary nation state borders, but in Guatemala with Mexico, of course, to the west and the rest of Central America to the east and south. Um, and then uh, my research mostly focuses on the highlands. So I've put this topographic map so that you can see the highlands sort of um, here. It's, it's this area here um, in the highlands, basically. And th th this is a lake that will come up in the presentation later. So I like to just point to it at the beginning. Um, and then a closer look, this is a, um, a map of archaeological sites and previous settlements and contemporary cities as well. Um, and this is Lake Atitlan, which how, how many of us have been to Guatemala at all? Have any of us? To the border of Chiapas. To the border of Chiapas, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, Lake Atitlan is a very usually recognizable place if people have gone there because it's a very big tourist destination, um, but also, you know, uh, historically um, uh, Tsutuhil land uh, and Kachikel land to on either side of the bo of the lake and so I'll be talking a little bit about this and in, uh, in, in, in its sort of historical trajectory but um, that's just a little bit of a geographic context contextualization um, I'm gonna begin the presentation with uh, a few words from the Popol Vuh uh, which is probably the most famous example of indigenous writing, especially in the context of colonization, written, uh, initially written uh, or originally written between 1550, 1550 and 1554 uh, in, under the context of alphabetization of Mayan languages, evangelization and European invasion. Um, but I like to use it because I think it's a visible example and maybe a more recognizable how many of us have heard or read uh, or engaged with the Popol Vuh at all. Um, and so it's an interesting text and a difficult text to introduce as well because it's so many things. Um, it's uh, an iteration in time of broadly Mesoamerican ideas and concepts, meaning what's in it has actually been recorded many times before then, but this particular iteration really interacts with sort of uh, an imposing colonial order, uh, right? Uh, an alphabetical rendering of knowledge and memory keeping elsewhere rendered in a variety of ways, like I just said a creation story, a recording of lineages, a claim to authority, and also a text that continues to be reinterpreted and translated and especially reclaimed uh, today. Uh, and so this very brief example is an example from the what I think is probably the most famous passage where um, the hero twins descend to the underworld or Xibalba and they have a ball game against the lords of Xibalba and defeat them after their uh, predecessors. Predecessors, yeah. Uh, had actually been defeated by the Lords of Xibalba, but they go and they beat all their um, tricks and and uh, and trials, right? Uh, and um, and defeat them, and then they go on and take the pl their rightful place as the sun and the moon, uh, and then the creation uh, can actually happen. Uh, but there's a word that expresses this type of defeat here, and it says, "I'm going to read the passage for those of us who aren't here and can't see the slide." And it says, "When they arrived, they all came to give themselves up." They came to weep, and thus was the defeat of the Lords of Xibalba. Um, and so that defeat, specifically, um, in the Spanish we see, así fue la derrota. Um, and in the Quiche we see, uh, chacatahic, quichacatahic, their defeat. This chacatahic is a concept that happens uh, across many texts in indigenous languages and in many different important instances in the Popol Vuh where folks are being sort of politically sub assumed or um, um, uh, placed in a hierarchical relationship with other groups or, or other uh, social or linguistic groups. Uh, and so in my research, after looking at uh, texts that are uh, written in indigenous languages, texts that friars wrote to sort of translate um, and use indigenous language to evangelize, uh, other uh, documents like chronicles that the, Spani that the Spaniards wrote to sort of narrate conquest but also argue for benefits under the colonial government. What I've noticed is that this idea 
uh, comes up a lot. And sometimes it gets translated as conquest. Sometimes it gets translated as victory. Sometimes it gets tr translated as defeat. And so um, that's sort of where the seed of um, the project that is the book that I'm writing uh, comes out of. And so in the book, I'm concerned with the notion of conquest and reducción, which I'll explain here in a second, and try to put it in perspective in the ways that writing and other media had, especially in communicating things like the sense of political units, uh, who has authority over those political or territorial units, uh, and then, of course, the role that language, languages, translation uh, had and continue to have in those dynamics. And so um, the title of the book, working title, is Chibashri Chakatahik, which sort of translates to written conquest, reduction and territory in the highlands of Guatemala. And so I look at like the appearance in the documents of political units, uh, what in Spanish we call pueblos or naciones or in English towns or cities or um, basically political units and how they get named, how they get translated, and then in those moments how folks are arguing uh, for who should have authority over them, basically. Um, that's sort of like the big, huge arc of the book, and I'm happy to talk about any of those parts. Um, but what I want to focus on today is the little piece of it that I'm working on, uh, which is this last one that we see on the screen, translating Chacatahic, Multilingual Exchanges and Incorporations. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I am understanding translation in the context of the colonial period, why I think it's important. And then I'm going to look at one specific example from a type of document that um, that is from the 16th century. And so one of the big concepts that I look at is the concept of reducción. And reducción, um, I guess the translation to English would be re reduction, maybe. Um, uh, now I feel sort of put on the spot of, I say this word in Spanish, and I, you know, I, I think it matters that it's in Spanish. It was very much like a blueprint for conquest. Uh, and it meant all these different things. It meant congregation in the sense of founding uh, pueblos de Indios, as they were called, uh, where folks would be more easily exploited for labor, uh, collected tribute, uh, counted, uh, demographically kept track of, and especially evangelized, which was, of course, the, the European justification for the whole enterprise. Um, and so this involves many, many processes, like all those physical ones that we've just spoken about, like a spiritual aspect of evangelization, but also it involves a linguistic aspect of dealing with the languages, uh, transforming, wielding, first of all, learning, and then also wielding those languages back in processes like evangelization. Um, so what I have up on the, on the screen right now are two maps. Uh, the one on the left is the map of the lake that I pointed out in the, uh, in the big maps before. And then the, the lake is again in that top right corner on the other side. So these are the maps of the Relaciones Geográficas that are extant for the area that we now know as Guatemala. Uh, and they were made at the end of the 16th century um, as a response to the Relaciones Geográficas, which will be the example that I'll talk about more in a little bit. But I think that they're very sort of breathtaking and interesting maps that we can talk more about if we want to at the end. Uh, but I just read them as part of this uh, sort of like surveying, categorizing, almost like inventory keeping gaze and project. Um, uh, the, I want to share this, um, this, ex, this quote from uh, Francisco Marroquín, who was the first bishop of Guatemala, um, which really expresses this idea of reducción in a broad sense. And he says, your majesty, he's writing to the king, and he says, your majesty knows that in the province of Guatemala, the largest part is all mountains, a very rough and rugged land, and with houses set at large distances from each other. If indigenous folks are not brought together, it will be impossible to indoctrinate them. This gathering together of the Indian towns is the most important thing for these parts. Since they are men, it's only right that they should live together and in company, which will have a positive effect on their spirits and bodies. We must get to know them, and they must get to know us, which is very creepy uh, and very, like, you can see this sort of, idea of wanting to get like um, uh, the, the, a summary, I think, of the congregation and the gathering and the displacement, of course, and, and relocation. Um, but this idea of knowing, uh, right? And this idea, of course, of uh, since they are men, <laughs> it's only right that they should live together as if, as if they didn't in their own way, right? But anyway, I like to use that one as an example because this is one of the highest religious authorities in that, in that moment. And it speaks to this 
uh, approach being sort of like uh, an official method. Um, and so um, that's sort of a second layer of context on the project as a whole and to, so to sort of land in the little rabbit hole that I'm in right now or the topic that I want to talk to you all about, which is translation specifically. Um, I'll talk a little bit about translation and colonial context, and then we'll look at the example from, from these questionnaires that I'm mentioning. Um, so um, uh, I want to just do like a mini lit review of folks that I'm thinking with as I think about translation. Uh, it had a foundational role in the attempts to establish, co-opt, as well as resist European colonial and imperial projects. Baja Faudre poignantly states that, and this is a quote, Translation was at the center of almost every aspect of conquest and colonial interaction. It was the engine through which the gears of divergent cultural and linguistic systems came into contact and began to move in response to each other, rather smoothly and often with grinding violence." End quote. The superposition of Western namings over indigenous forms of organization drove European observations about interactions with and manipulations of indigenous societies. Similarly, indigenous folks asked and sought to answer questions about the invading peoples and their systems. Early colonial translations took place in a context of surveillance, gathering of information from indigenous populations, and evangelization, often moving through several uh, languages, but also often through several indigenous languages. It also included the translation of documents, often into Spanish or one of the sanctioned indigenous languages in le which legal documents were accepted, which is something that sometimes we don't think happened, but in the archives a lot of documents are, say in Nahuatl or in Quiche, um, even presented uh, to colonial authorities as you know, legit papers that are part of, part of the record. Um, legit with big quotations, of course, but yes. Even some of the most iconic examples of alphabetic indigenous writing from the early colonial period are extant today via the transcription and therefore gaze of European intermediaries such as Jimenez's transcription of the Popol Vuh. And so if we're not familiar, the Popol Vuh, uh, the copy that, that is extant uh, is from actually the 18th century, and we know that the person who transcribed it and translated from Quichén to, into Spanish um, was copying it from somewhere else, but that first copy is lost. And so what we have is a friar's rendering from the 18th century. Um, in the composition of indigenous alphabetic writings, the same type of interaction was taking place with the matrix moving in the opposite direction. Appropriating alphabetic writing, indigenous authors, scribes, intermediaries, leaders, and also leaders to be engaged the violently in post-colonial order from the very beginning of the process that would make Castilian the language of the larger world. And um, uh, this, is part f uh, this is part of a chapter that I'm writing that's going into a volume about multilingual poetics, and I use this idea of the um, language of the larger world, uh, referring to this quote from Daniel Cobb from Say We Are Nations, which is actually about more contemporary indigenous activism in Turtle Island. Uh, he writes, it is one thing to talk the language of the larger world, it is something completely different to have your audience make the correct translation. So, uh, the other person whose work I, I use uh, and really influences me is Kelly McDonough. She offers that indigenous peoples in New Spain were not simply being acted upon or extracted from, but they too were trying to make sense of their others, translating through their own cultural frameworks. That was a quote. Centering power differentials in cultural translations or mistranslations, uh, McDonough contributes to a line of scholars thinking about these dynamics by describing colonial static, which she describes as uh, the noise that renders a message indiscernible or invisible, due to conscious and or unconscious inability to think beyond one own ontological and epistemological borders. Um, so I think that's probably, I won't elaborate on that, we can talk more about it, uh, but those are sort of the, the, the guiding, some of the guiding ideas. Following these scholars, I am interested here in discussing translation as a central aspect or point of entry to the multilingual poetics of conquest, and I want to look at an example then of the Relaciones Geográficas. And so what the Relaciones Geográficas were, were a questionnaire that the crown, uh, the, the royal cosmographer designed in the late 16th century. Uh, so it was a 52, 52 question, uh, 52 item questionnaire that the crown sent over to the Americas uh, where people had to go out and find this information, compile it and send it back to the king. Uh, 
because they wanted to know what was happening, who was there, and what was there in these territories that they were claiming possession and authority over, right? And so the questions include things from what is the land like? Are there a lot of mountains? Are there a lot of rivers? What type of agricultural products are folks growing? Uh, how many people in each town? Uh, how many convents? How many churches? Are the roads good? Um, is the land fertile? Etc. 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 As well as a bunch of information that would be, we would say, perhaps ethnographic. So, who are the folks that live there? What are the languages that they speak? What are their traditions? what is their political organization, what are their spiritual or religious practices, and that type of information, right? And so it's simultaneously surveying, simultaneously categorizing, uh, what's the word, Inven making an inventory, uh, of course, of like resources that can be extracted, as well as um, uh, uh, the sort of cultural, religious, social makeup of, of folks. Uh, there's another aspect of it that I won't get too much into, but we can come back into the discussion, which is also, it was also, we usually tend to think of, okay, the crown wanted to oversee what was happening, and we really think about it in the imposition of the crown upon indigenous land and people, and that's absolutely mostly what I'm focusing on here, but there's also an added component where European folks who got there first and reported back to the king would basically report back whatever, and they would say, oh yeah, like you gave me this plot of land and there's this many people, uh, but there could be twice or thrice or as many, right? And so it's like also uh, keeping on tabs on even colonial uh, agents as well. So that's an interesting thing that uh, I remember when I like thought about that or sort of clicked for the first time. I was like, you see how many layers. Um, so one of the questions is draw a map of the place. And so there's a really big collection of these from Mexico that are really interesting because they're vastly different from each other. There's only two extant ones from Guatemala. These are them. Um, uh, the Mexico ones, they're online. At the, uh, the archive is actually at Texas, uh, and so you can see them. But it's really interesting because the maps are so different, and sometimes they're a bird's eye view, and sometimes they're a uh, perspective view, and sometimes they're something that we would, from our modern perspective, n not even consider a map. So there's a whole big conversation about mapping here, of course. There's really famous work by uh, Barbara Mundy, for example, that looks at those maps specifically. Um, but I put them there to sort of uh, orient us in, in, in that. I'm looking here specifically at the questionnaire. Uh, so I want to take a look at uh, just one example of, of, of this. This is from uh, the Relación Geográfica de Atitlán. Um, uh, and in uh, question 14, this is from question 14, which I think is a fruitful site for thinking through multilingualism and translation because it deals with registers of authority in the context of European in invasion, alliances and enmities between indigenous political units were utilized by invaders to aid their cause. Question 14 asks about systems of authority and rule uh, and 15 continues asking about meaningful alliances or disputes that took place. Uh, in the Relación from Atitlán, the answer to this question refers to indigenous collaborators that are listed on the text. And so in this particular example, um, the Relación, the text at the top actually lists and they say, we talk to these people and these people and these people, these are their names. Uh, in the Zapotitlán one, it's just one person answering it and you don't know specifically where he got his information, which is another interesting dynamic. But referring to the folks that they talked to to get this information in the report, they say that they were old, principal, naturals of this town, meaning native and important people, you know, who had leadership positions in the community. Uh, name my name at the header of this relación, and I'm reading from the quote now, having been asked all together and each one separately in the lengua mexicana, which they understand about the context of the 14th chapter of said instruction, meaning the questionnaire, uh, they said, they said that in the time of their infidelity, this town's naturals were subject to the lords or caciques, naturals of this head town, Cabecera, such as Tecpan Totot, as is the name in the lengua mexicana of the cacique and natu natural lord of this town and its subjects, and in the mother tongue is called Achtzikin Hai. And so the text is up there in, in the Spanish, which is a transcription by Rene Acuña, and then the English translation is mine. But I just want to spend a little bit of time in this one piece of this huge uh, questionnaire because there's a lot of things to think through here. One is that we see visible the process of interro interrogation and information extraction, uh, basically. Uh, having been asked all together and then each one separately to sort of corroborate whether uh, 
they're trying to trick or do something uh, in, in, as they answer the questions. Um, in the lengua mexicana, which is Nahuatl, right? And so uh, part of the conquest and the colonial enterprise into Central America includes uh, a dynamic of uh, uh, indigenous folks who came with the Spaniards who spoke Nahuatl, and then Nahuatl grew as a lingua franca that was utilized throughout Mesoamerica as well. And so if you think for a moment what's happening here is that the king sent uh, a questionnaire in, in Castilian or in Spanish, the uh, local colonial authorities re uh, received it. They were like, okay, we're going to go find out these answers. They brought interpreters who spoke Nahuatl to go ask these questions in Nahuatl of Tsutuhil folks who also spoke Nahuatl, who maybe answered in Tsutuhil. And then from the Tsutuhil, the Nahuatl got translated back to the person that wrote these answers down, right? And so um, quite a process of translation and interpretation. If we think about McDonald back on like, how much you can see and how much you can't see and understand what words mean or concepts, right? Um, that's, there's a lot of, I, like I would say, maybe vibrating tension in those processes. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, and then they say, of course, that the, this town's naturals were subject to the Lord Sir Caciques. Cacique itself is a word that comes from the Caribbean, right? Uh, and denotes a certain... Um, type of position of social power uh, within a community or a political organization, right? So we see those translations also happening across the languages in the, in the very text. Um, but they say that they were subject to Tecpantotot, which is the Nahuatl translation of the local lineage into Tuhil, which is Tzikinhai. Uh, so Tzikinhai is one of the main lineages that ruled what we know as a group as the Tzutuhil, who is one of the Mayan languages still spoken today in Guatemala. Um, so uh, I just wanted to give this as an example of the of how I'm seeing like the process where translations are being di driven, driving the collection of information, the collection that, as McDonald tells us, they're also gathering. Like, what are they asking me? How are they asking me? What are they? How are they understanding it? What are the people who are translating these questions even asking, and how? And the last part of this, which is my favorite, and I say favorite in like a very kind of ironic m way, maybe, is they say. Um, dijeron que en, en el tiempo de su infidelidad, uh, in the time of their infidelity, right, before uh, they were converted to Christianity, of course, right? And that's really interesting to me because, of course, the religious justification of the campaign is always at the forefront. And I'm just thinking through the question of denoting the no, the time uh, or conveying a certain time via the lack or adherence to a religion is already interesting, but I just can't imagine that they walked up somebody and said, in the time of your infidelity, and they were like, oh yeah, in the time of my infidelity, we did X, Y, and Z. And so you have sort of the retranslation of a religious order as well, uh, as it gets noted down back in the, uh, in the document that will go to the crown that speaks this larger, the, this language of the larger world in which a notion like Tiempos de su infidelidad, times of their infidelity, they did things this way, is legible. And so I just wanted to stay, spend a little bit of time in this one specific example that comes from the, from the questionnaires. At stake in the description, classification, and attribution of land and resources is authority, of course. In sources like the Relaciones, a set of agents vied for resources or, or tribute exemptions, um, for example, as they communicated an idea of the land and people to the far-off crown through its intermediaries. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it there, um, um, and we can talk. I have some, some slides of selected bibliography if folks are interested. But yeah, I'll shut up now and hear what you'll have to say. Thank you so much for coming. Quiz questions. Uh, I, I think just to comment, I mean, I just think it's very interesting, just the whole concept of translation I think I don't really see it until I understand it a bit more but like you know obviously things get lost in translation mm -hmm. right Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah things get lost in translation and, and I'm, I was just thinking while you were talking even because you, you, you mentioned the whole religious aspect of this and how even if they received an answer, they would make it their own 
just to sort of equate it to their religious language, right? I, I just think that it's, it's so interesting, this notion that even if we speak the same language, there's a language within a certain group, in this case, religion, right? Or academia can be another. And so there's a bunch of these different groups within the same language that if I wasn't an expert on it, I wouldn't be able to translate it to so-and-so, and then they would be able to translate it to so-and-so. So I don't know, it's just this, like, there's this continuing translation going on, not just from different languages, but from different groups within the same language. Mm -hmm. It's just it's very fascinating. I didn't really think of it that way until now that you explained it, so... But I, I think it's like visually also uh, observable when you watch, like you, if you see these maps, yeah. these maps are clear representation how like per, like people have different perceptions mm -hmm. and, and the, their way to represent <coughs> things and, and also probably like have their, like uh, in links with their own agendas, mm -hmm. if it's um, religious or, or um, political. Um, and uh, I mean, I just like was wondering if, um, for instance, this language uh, was actually written in that way at that time. Was it a written language? Uh, okay, that's a great question. So it became an alphabetically written language after European invasion. Uh, the the. And by them, I can assume. By yeah. So what? So there's two. There's two. The process is basically the following. Uh, it was the the folks who were in charge or did most of the translating and especially the a lot of the things that got produced in that time were like dictionaries uh, or grammars um, so like linguistic studies of the languages themselves and then especially like religious treatises and com like confessionaries and things like that that are like pedagogical tools for evangelization basically yeah. right and so like that is an inextricable those things are inextricable the the alphabetization of the languages and the religious project right and and um, the folks who l were taught how to write alphabetically were often from higher classes or echelons or pos uh, had positions of authority within uh, indigenous communities uh, to begin with right and so a lot of what's happening is like the speaking of indigenous authority back to colonial authority using its own methods, right? And so um, uh, legal documents and not only religious ones would st start being start being written through in, in alphabetical ways, right? And so like another one of the documents that I look at is uh, another, this, these are very canonical, the Popolu is super canonical. Um, the uh, the other one is called the Shahil Chronicle. The Memorial de Solola is another as another one. Uh, Solola is actually like up the hill, up the hill this way in the lake, somewhat close to this lake. Um, and it it's very interesting to see how it keeps it's an alphabetical record and then eventually brings in like years and it starts being like in 1571 this and this happened and this and this happened and then. Uh, folks have studied how it matches up with like the local governance that were colonial positions but that were actually inhabit uh, occupied by indigenous folks um, and so all of that process is both ways of that uh, like using and understanding indigenous languages from the uh, European perspective to control and evangelize and then also folks who got to which is not a it's not a majority of folks by any extent of the imagination who got to uh, learn alphabetic writing uh, as a way to interact with colonial governance for one but then for two they also started writing things that weren't for Spanish eyes right and so certain manuscripts didn't get found for a really long time found by us as like folks who aren't part of those uh, communities right which I think you start getting into the politics of this translation for example and it's like why like why does why does a why does a document or an idea have to be legible to outsiders and, and when and all that? So I don't know if that makes sense to answer your question. No, uh, it does. Yeah. Um, and and how, uh, how is this language 
uh, going right now? Uh, there's so the most widely spoken Mayan language in Guatemala uh, is Quiche, which is the language that the Popol Vuh has written in. There's about there's over a million speakers. Wow. And and they write it as well. To okay. varying degrees. So the so again like the educational the educational systems in in all of Central America and all of Latin America probably dealing with indigenous languages haven't been very th there has been for a much longer time an effort to eradicate them than to teach them right um, so they're supposed to be bilingual education just like in Mexico they're supposed to be bilingual education but it's not very good so like a lot of people aren't writing it today but a lot of people are so there's a lot of people who are writing literature in indigenous languages um, yeah so Quiche, there's over a million speakers. Cachiquel, which is the next one, I think it's like half a million, and then there's less speakers of Sotuhil. And they, uh, these aren't, I mean, uh, there's like a technical definition of an endangered language based on number of speakers, and they're not endangered under that sort of technical definition. They're certainly, they're certainly, uh, like they're in danger, I would say, just because, but, but, uh, I think that, that that's a conversation that's happening and it gains more and more vis visibility too. And so I think there's also a lot of efforts of revitalization and reclamation happening as well. Germany, I, I've been thinking about this for quite some time. Germany is one of the few European countries that calls itself something else from what everyone else calls it. So they call themselves Deutschland, land of the Dutch, but we call them Hermani, the warlike men. Huh? In Central America and Latin America in general, you obviously because of the power dynamic, you see mm. the Spanish naming w the now modern countries that we have. Venezuela, because they saw uh, people living on stilts, so it looked like Venice, so a little Venice, Be Venecia, Venezuela. Colombia, la tierra de Colón. Costa Rica, bueno, una Costa Rica. How was it? How did it happen? How did it develop that countries like Guatemala retained its its indigenous title, its indigenous name, when its neighbors were losing theirs to to European hegemony? Hmm, that's super interesting. So Guatemala is uh, is from the Nahuatl, mm -hmm. uh, place of I think it's reeds, uh, and so it was a name that was given uh, after. Uh, after invasion through European and now speaking uh, collaboration or you know mapping or surveying of uh, of some kind um, the name in in Mayan languages for Guatemala is actually Ishimuleu which means land of corn uh, I can write it on the board in a minute uh, uh, so I don't know I don't know that it did frankly like especially in terms of especially in terms of choosing a name that is the name that the language of the larger world speaks. Um, I think that it is indicative of its history and its trajectory in the sense that the role that Nahuatl, for example, had. So, there's so many place names throughout Mesoamerica that have Nahuatl names, uh, even in their Spanish version of those names, because they are the names in Nahuatl. And so mm, that's the way that... Um, that's the way that they started to get recorded in, in say, tribute lists or maps like these, uh, et cetera. And so I think that there is, you can see both effects, like the effects of uh, the process of surveying and colonization, as well as the effects of like local authority, right? So like the example that I had for the, for the relación Tecpan Totot, which is a way to render a local authority into Nahuatl so that it is recognized by folks who are conducting this, right? And yet, Tikinhai is the name of the local lineage. Uh, and so a lot of the time, they're both, they're both happening, right? And the names, the, a lot of the indigenous namings are ba based on local features and local uh, things that are there, right? So like Atitlan, Atitlan is a Nahuatl name uh, right. uh, for water. Um, uh, for example, right, and so. But that's that's exactly my point. Like, uh, there's a there's a clear power dynamic between the 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 invader and the invaded. Mm -hmm. How come in this case, at least um, etymologically speaking, we have a country named by the invaded rather than the invader? Mm 
Whereas when we look at other places, for the same thing, it's the invader mm -hmm. putting the name. Yeah. So what was the power dynamic like in Guatemala that, let's say, was different from, digamos, um, yeah. Costa Rica, Honduras, or Honduras, whatever. Yeah. Lo que sea. Yeah. El Salvador. El Salvador, imagines. Yeah. Exactamente. Yeah. No, yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that I have an answer. Uh, but uh, I also don't know. Nahuatl is not. There's a version of Nahuatl. Uh, that is spoken in like southern in southern Guatemala and El Salvador uh, but now what I wouldn't say is the is a native tongue to to Guatemala right uh, now what is much more from central Mexico and, and other places in Mexico or what we know now as Mexico right, right. because of right for for another naming of a big thing based on one group right uh, so yeah a, a, an infinite conversation for sure but uh, and, and these indigenous communities, like they, they, they got their uh, language uh, into an alphabet, like did they write their own versions of the, what happened or, um, because mm -hmm. you said that it was discovered by mm -hmm. you, I don't know, you, like folks like you, like researchers. <laughs> 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 yeah. But, um, Westerners. <laughs> yeah, Westerners. <laughs> so did they actually take that advantage to like also bring, um, uh, yeah, like leave uh, mm -hmm. proofs. Have For uh, sure. So the the I mean the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, a lot of this, a lot of these documents aren't documents that I am working on my own. Uh, that I found somewhere and I was like, oh, I'm gonna. A lot of these have have are very well. They're very well studied. They're transcribed. They're translated into many languages. So. There's ver many versions of them, and they're available in that sense. I look at things that are in archives that are mostly like dictionaries and things like that. Sometimes there are versions of different ones that exist. Sometimes there's only one of them, and it happens to be that. Sometimes it's letters, for example. So like they wrote letters. Folks study like petitions that they wrote to the king, for example, just like Spaniards wrote petitions to the king to say, "Hey, I served you uh, in the conquer of in the conquering of this land, and I did this work for you. Will you give me some land, or will you give me some right?" Uh, indigenous folks wrote sometimes in indigenous languages those types of documents, but they also wrote documents that didn't get turned into any colonial authority and that they were kept. And so then we have the, this discourse of discovery, right, of when does an alphabetic text become discovered and it becomes discovered whenever an academic or somebody who goes and writes a book about it or an article about it uh, introduces it to like the larger world, quote unquote, right? Uh, and that's something. So like the, uh, the uh, land titles is another type of genre that got written a lot, uh, the, delineating whose land and, and that type of thing. Uh, and so one of the really, f one of the most famous ones uh, written in Quiche was, and, and for those who aren't here, in, and I'm speaking into the microphone so that the recording <laughs> understands that I'm being, making huge air quotes when I say discovered, was discovered in the 80s by an anthropologist who then translated it. And so, oh, now we have this other text that helps us, you know, joins the constellation of texts that are written alphabetically that we have. But they, you know, like a community had it in their coffers and they chose to share it with this person specifically who was a linguist, right? And so there's a lot that has to do with the communities or the uh, approaches or the uh, goals, right, that, that you were mentioning earlier of like, what are the texts for and for whom? Also, uh -huh. yeah, and and they're being kept by these communities. Like the, it's not that they have a library that people can go visit. Yeah, sometimes it depends. Sometimes uh, there's communities who have chosen to co to do collaborative work where they do uh, archive those texts. A lot of the texts are uh, folks who are Mayan. They say the the so th uh, another type of document is the codices, the uh, codices, codexes uh, that are in the type of writing that existed in Mesoamerica. So Mesoamerica had a s system of writing that wasn't alphabetical, but had, was logographic. So you have a lot of different like lienzos, like um, uh, papers that have uh, logographic inscriptions and writing, maps, uh, murals, right? Uh, that convey written information, just not European, written in a European script, right? So all of those things. And so that people speak of the codex, the names that the codex have are the names of where they're kept, right? So they ha you have a codex Madrid and a codex 
Mendoza, who was like the person who, quote unquote, again, quote unquote, discovered it, right? And so those politics of naming, for example, you know? And so you see folks who are trying to conte con con uh, contest that and they say, oh, the, code is the codex that's sequestered in Madrid or the codex that's sequ sequestered in this and that. Because a lot of those papers, because they were valuable for either monetarily or intellectually for intellectuals or academics, got taken from those places, right? And uh, so, like the Popol Vuh, that we, the Popol Vuh that I'm, the one that I'm talking about, that Jimenez transcribed, is in Chicago, for example. Uh, the Memorial de Solanas in Pennsylvania, <laughs> in mm -hmm. in collections. So there's another big discussion of like, where do these artifacts belong and to whom? Um, yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. Where Not to be sorry about. Where do they belong and to whom? Because Africa has been dealing with that forever. For sure. Um, so here's my question with the where are these artifacts and to whom do they belong? What about the artifacts that we don't even know about? Here's why I'm saying this. Because my understanding is that when it comes to the Vatican Library, and all of this happened in the name of God, in the name of Catholicism, right? In the Vatican Library, in order to, for researchers to gain access to the works in there, you have to know the, the work that you're looking for. Yeah. So it's there's no, oh, when I see it, I'll know it. No, you Let have to peruse. know exactly what it is. Yeah. So how do we know what to look for if we don't know what we're missing? Known, known knowns and known <laughs> known knowns. Right? Yeah. Right. You know what's in, 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 in libraries and in museums in the U.S. and in Spain and all that good stuff, but we ha there's no known inventory of what Mesoamerican documents the Vatican Library might be holding. Uh, yeah. I don't know. There might be some. I don't know. I don't know them personally. But yeah, I mean, that's sort of the political stance. And so when I say at the beginning that there's both contradictions and affordances to folks, right? Like, a lot of the study of indigenous language documents has been done by linguists or anthropologists and most often historically indigenous folks have been excluded from entering the discussions that are in anthropology and in linguistics of uh, 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 farther than this notion of informants quote unquote which I think is, gets only more and more outdated in, in social sciences by the day hopefully but when, you know, who knows? But, but, but okay, yeah, so no, no, go ahead, go ahead. A quick comparison. If you compare what's happening in Africa with what's happening in uh, Mesoamerica and, and, and South America in general, in my opinion, it's way easier in Africa to, to, to reclaim those lost artifacts because it's a political issue. Mm -hmm. it's, the UK has them in a, a, a state museum, and we want them back. It, it's pretty easy for me to talk shit about the, the British. That's easy. Mm -hmm. It's way more difficult for me to talk shit about my God and my God's physical representation on Earth. So let's say we're able to get back stuff in, in museums in, in Chicago and blah, blah, blah. How do we get back the stuff in the Vatican? Mm -hmm. Like, how, how, because now it's no longer a political debate, at least in my mind. Now it's a, it's a, a debate of religion. They were produced by us, they belong to us, but if God needs it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, know? I mean. So yeah. how, would we, how would we weather something like that? Like the political versus the religion? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that the religious is ever non-political, right? And so like, in my, like, I study this, and I started studying this because I'm from, uh, like Eric said, I'm from Costa Rica, a country that, had that it was Catholic in its constitution, right? And okay. so I'm much less interested in the philosophical debate of when and how is religion political than in the f fact that it has been wielded as such to create certain dynamics. Uh, I want to let you say, I see your hand, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't mean to cut no, in, please, thank please. you so much for your talk. Thank you for coming. In this conversation, thanks to everyone. Um, I wanted to go back to, um, Tiempo de su infidelidad, yeah. which you um, pointed out to, and I've just been, I don't know how to have a well formed question, but I've been thinking about this idea of infidelity and how rich it is for your project, um, and specifically this chapter, but I, for the whole project really. It seems like this idea of, you know, in one context, the religious context being um, 
infidel and, and that sense of, of infidelity, but then there's this also sense of, of fidelity of translation. Mm, right? Wow. In, in like what I didn't is even make that connection. To be, for, to be, you know, to have a true representation of, of um, uh, and then also there seems in this conversation about alphabetization, there's also this idea, I'm thinking about fidelity in terms of hi-fi, you know, in terms of sound, yeah. uh, high fidelity. Yeah. Um, and it seems like your project, is, at least in this chapter, is really interested in a kind of fidelity to this moment of contact, right? This moment of where mm, these, wow. this moment where um, Spanish, uh, not waddle uh, interpreter, in between translator and then M Maya indigenous, right? So there's this moment of contact in the highlands that your project's interested in seeming to be fidelitous to, right? Mm -hmm and to like, how do we get at this? And there's an impossibility here, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, we can't get to that sound moment, you know, that moment of sound and translation. So there's something speculative about your project to kind of reimagine that. Um, so yeah, I was wondering if you wanted to say more about infidelities, <laughs> but also the, the sense that there's an infidelity happening possibly between indigenous um, folks, indigenous languages, um, that they might be speaking to each other in a way that the Spanish person in power can't hear them, right? Uh -huh. And so there's an, uh, a, an infidelity going on, and like I think uh, uh, folks like Edgar Garcia has talked about the Popo Vuh and how how there are moments mm -hmm. in the text where we can s possibly see or imagine the the indigenous native folks speaking back to power For sure. within. Um, those texts and speaking to the moment of crisis and of colonialism in the text itself. So, yeah, I was wondering if you wanted to say more about infidelity. So I want you to say more about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. Thank you so much for that question. And I hadn't, you know, talk about academic titles and, 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 and words. And it's, I think, on the one hand, I have such like a visceral, like, uh, like, negative reaction to like okay here's the way that i'm gonna use this one word to explain everything right and and I, in a sense i feel like check at the heat that there was like a process of that too of being like oh you know i have to pick my thing and if i had to describe it in one sentence right and i think that's something that exists now i hadn't made the connection but between that fidelity uh the way that you just put it and it's to in, in terms of like the i hear like the startup on the speakers you know like the boom or something uh of 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 how much because how difficult, like I think about this in class all the time, it's so difficult to think about m media and the way that we interact with media and the way that media, it, uh, what like affects our life in the sense of uh, we have such immediacy of image and of sound uh, in, our, in our everyday lives and we're not just talking about all these things and all these things about translation that I said on there, but we're the, also the movement of ideas and of papers like literal papers right like it's such a diff it's such a it's such a oh I was taking notes on what you were saying <laughs> I really like this idea of like how do you even to a general type of public or to anybody that you want to have a conversation with give a picture that isn't just a picture but include some type of sound to like fill out what it is that we're talking about especially because so much of what we're doing is like talking about linguistic exchange and actually I gave a talk about this last week and somebody to asked me about exchange the word exchange uh, yeah. uh, and 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 I had to admit I put it in the title of the presentation and I didn't think too much about it because exchange has this like economic right and then it sounds really nice like uh, like a language exchange today is like I want to learn Spanish and you want to learn Cantonese let's practice together right and it's the, it's a very different type of exchange in that sense. So I really appreciate the the care and the observation because it it really did I, it like made me hear that sound in my head of like a surround sound starting up and thinking about how do you fill up these gaps, right? Like you only have language and then on the book you even have l less emotion and stuff, but it it helps me to think about that. I don't know the times of your infidelity is, I mean, it's just bananas to me to think that, like, uh, there's no way you're saying that to somebody's face. You know what I mean? Like, there's nobody, there's no way that somebody's being like, oh, yeah, in my infidelity, when I used to be. 
And at the same time, in other documents, there's a wielding of the mission of evangelization back to power in this way. And this is folks, folks have written about this a lot, like the, you know, uh, writing against empire uh, and, and things like these are tropes that exist in the genealogy of intellectuals. The, the, even the colonial static that I mentioned that McDonough mentions, you know, there was a, somebody else before that wrote double mistaken identity to sort of describe this uh, concept of like, I say one thing and you, even if you translate it to your language, you were still not talking about the same thing, specifically in the context of colonization. The infidelity religion aspect of it, uh, there is a time, for example, in another document that I take a look at where they say, and we were really grateful that the friars, the Franciscan friars, because there's a, all kinds of beef even between the Franciscans and the Dominicans that includes like territorial and translation. Like how do we translate Christian concepts into the languages? Like the orders themselves have beef in between them. But in a document in Cachiquel, they say, we're really glad that the Franciscan friars got here and started teaching the gospel in our language finally. And we saw the light. And so, and so they wield it in this way where, uh, I mean, I and other folks read it as like a political choice to align themselves with uh, somebody, i.e. the orders that have a certain type of authority and influence in what happens, right? A lot of the time through religious institutions, uh, we're able to keep in check or curb certain of the abuses that like encomenderos uh, and things like that. Or also there was like positions within the parishes that were beneficial for folks to occupy. And so they do wield, like I have seen it wielded in a positive sense of like, finally, we've been, we've, we've had the doctrine in our language and can understand it and, and have been able to leave behind our, our old ways, uh, our wrong ways under a Christian gaze, right? Uh, and I don't think, I mean, if I had to guess, I don't think that they meant that, but that it was a useful thing to say. Um, but maybe they did. So kind of related to that, um, to what degree was were the conductors of these surveys and everything, to what degree was this kind of like beholden to a centralized political power? And, and what I mean by that is like you were mentioning that the, the orders had the, this beef between them and then that there were people that had different interests. There were friars that actually had some sense of cultural sensitivity where they were actually trying to understand and then there was other people that kind of just wanted wanted things to be, you know, political, you know, taking over and just exploiting. Mm -hmm. So, and then my, the bigger question that kind of brought up was, to what degree is the Spanish crown actually interested in these cultural aspects or actually prescribing a, a centralized project, or was it more kind of like an ad hoc um, type of thing? That's, those are great questions. Thank you. What's your name? Lucas. Lucas. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna answer. I, I'm gonna try to answer them or say something that makes sense to them in order. The first thing that I'll say is there's a narrative of uh, uh, that I might have even just uh, reified in the last thing that I said. Uh, a narrative of dichotomy between religious authorities and non-religious authorities. Um, and I will say that whether there were degrees of magnitude or not. I personally very much see the evangelization process that included an ethnographic gaze and questions about culture and questions about language as an exploitative project, right? Um, because it, it, even though it included um, uh, knowledge keeping and knowledge production, it was still ingrained in like, uh, I actually need to eradicate these things so that you can see that you're wrong about the, how you live your life and you start living this way, right? So I just want to say that. Uh, because I might have said something that w went in the opposite direction in my last answer, but I want to say that aloud and say it into the microphone. Um, but also, uh, so, that's, so that's the first part of that question. The second part of that question is uh, a very good one, which I think it took, it took me a really long time to even see that uh, Matisse, that um, nuance, because yes, I think that it is a, large scale uh, uh, elicited from the crown cosmographer whose job it was to map, right? Which is of course in this moment uh, of a European expansion westward, a big deal of like keeping track and, and you start seeing the evolution of the maps and things like that. And so it's like a mapping and a keeping track, but also like a super important economic uh, 
uh, process because they're really needing to keep track of like the coffers, right? Like what's coming back and how much should be coming back and, and that type of thing. So I think in that sense, it, is, it uh, comes out of the biggest sort of center of authority that exists, which is the crown that gives legitimation to the campaign altogether. Precisely what's interesting about the translation and the things that are happening in it is that once they arrive in all these towns, you get such vastly different results, right? And I think that you also get vastly different results because it depended on who got it in what place also, right? So this is one aspect. This is one example of this type of project. This one was like systematic and widespread. But a lot of the time, uh, colonial officials got sent to do inspections, right? Uh, and things like that. And part of the inspections were also, yes, I think, contained the surveying uh, uh, need or desire by the crown. But also when you got there, you weren't dealing with just uh, vying for power and authority and resources between native and non-native folks, but also like, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, folks who were there who were Spaniards or maybe Criollos a few generations afterwards who were really, had a vested interest in hiding certain realities from from the people who came to collect taxes from them, right? Like that still happens. Uh, uh, so does that answer sort of the first question? Is yeah, that meaningful? Yeah, for okay, sure. cool. And then the second question, I might have forgotten it. Can you? Um, it was basically like to kind of, to what degree was it? Oh, I remember it. Yeah. I don't think it was like a multiculturalist, let's uh, bring in all the diversity of languages and traditions like we would see in the 21st century, right? I think it, I think it was uh, the reason and the impetus behind it was to see how you could use those things to better instill a, a, a colonial governance of those colonies. Um, so I think I think about it as a very sort of top-down political project. These these specific uh, questionnaires and, and processes, rather than you know I don't know. It's an interesting thing. I think the question about uh, a friar, for example, like Jimenez, for an example, who was the person who transcribed the extant version that we have of the Popol Vuh, like how much was he interested in rescuing uh, Mayan knowledges, as we would say today, for example, and like preserve them, versus how much was he like, oh yeah, like we can use this to, <laughs> to, 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 to our, to our own ends, to uh, they must get to know us and we must, ne- we must get to, we must get to know them and they must get to know us, like Madro King, the bishop said. So I think that's all wrapped up in like an ethnographic process. I mean, ethnography ethnography itself, I think, you know, I think begins as an imperial uh, mission. Was this, was this kind of like, was, were these projects done within a somewhat peaceful context or were there still kind of open revolts going on? Um, so in the larger context, uh, there was definitely revolts happening in many places and the places that you know like we these are the only two that we have for the whole of what we now understand as Guatemala for example which means that in a bunch of other places either they didn't happen and if they happen they're lost but maybe they just didn't have the wherewithal to be able to carry it out Uh, which could mean a variety of different things it could mean that they just couldn't find the people to talk to it could mean that the people didn't want to talk to them it could mean that um, they the instruction didn't make it to that particular uh, city or something, uh, and I I'd, I'd give a similar prologue to this answer as I gave to the friar answer, which is I think it's absolutely ingrained and part of and inextricable from a colonial project that is a violent project, um, and yet uh, something like these two wouldn't have been able to happen. Uh, if they wouldn't have had whatever type of relationship. And it's hard for me to say it was absolutely 100% coerced or they actually used it strategically, uh, like McDonald says, to find out things about the people who were asking the questions. Uh, but like that Titlan one, they're, they get listed and stuff. And so a lot of what happened was folks who had local authority a lot of the time, when, they, when it came to interacting to the colonial government, they said, we already run stuff here. Like, you need me. To, you need to go through me if you want to have any success in getting tribute payments, getting products out of here. So, like, is me or you go figure out how you do it. So that happened, too. So it's like the, mul- the, the uses of the political clout go both ways in that, in that sense. And then to close and uh, to, cl- to, to, to finalize that, I think um, 
this is also thing, something that I'm not coming up with this idea in this moment. It's something that's been studied, but we tend to think of conquest in a way that's really immediate. And so we say Spanish America, 1492, or conquest of Guatemala, 1524, um, as if uh, as as if it was an instant, right? Um, but that was like an un not only ongoing, but also often very incomplete process. There's like a really iconic date that's 1697 of like the last bastion of completely autonomous Maya population in northeastern Guatemala uh, that didn't fall under the control of the Spanish until 1697 officially. But I think that there's an argument too for like that, that there's an incomplete process of coloniality to this day, right? Uh, of, of colonialism uh, to this day, uh, wherein there's effects and navigations of those impositions, of those languages, of those political and economic uh, impositions, but not a complete incorporation, if that makes sense. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for coming to our first tertulia. Just want to give a last round of applause to our folks. Thank you all. I appreciate it.